Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're looking at a vintage model, and I, and I say that a little reluctantly because these were popular back when I was uh, just a little out of high school, starting to college. So it seems funny thinking back to that vintage era now, but I guess it's a little bit newer than what we, what a lot of us think of as vintage speakers. These were mid-80s, 85, 86, uh, where these things were released. Uh, whereas a lot of the earlier stuff, mid, mid to late 70s, is kind of what we typically think of as a vintage speaker. But this is kind of in that same category. And unlike some of the late 70s, early 80s models that were out there, these actually have some pretty good attributes. And when I say pretty good attributes, I mean these measured pretty well to a degree. Let's dive into this thing and take a look at it. It's a big speaker and I picked it up while I was down in Houston last month. I was down there for a track meet and I brought this back with me from a customer. He wanted me to meet him and bring it, uh, bring it up and take a look at it and see what I could do with it. Um, first thing we did was just set this thing up and took some measurements and we took a measurement at one watt, one meter to kind of get a level and then we moved out a little further. I think we were at uh, 52 inches out and 60 something inches out and we were comparing that measurement with the one watt one meter to see if there was any differences in the in the in the distances because we've got acoustic centers that are pretty far apart and actually there wasn't a whole lot of difference with it from the one meter to measurements that we took a little bit further away so um, let's let's take a look at first of all just the on-axis frequency response and when I say on-axis I mean on tweeter axis. So we were right in line with this tweeter and we took some measurements at the way the customer had this set and then we tweaked it a little trying to find out where the best spot was on these controls. Now these controls are basically just a variable resistor that's in line with the tweeter in the mid. So it allows you to kind of turn those levels up and down. And the way the customer had it set was really close. Barely even off, just a little bit. To where it is now where we felt like it had the best smoothest response and let's take a look at it it's it's actually really smooth i mean it's plus or minus 2 db and i don't ever see that with any of these models like this i typically never see response anywhere close to that it's usually all over the place and all up and down and they did that with very few crossover parts they just threw some caps and cools on this thing granted the crossover points are pretty high and there is some things going on when you start moving off axis. So let's let's take a look at that first. Let's look at the vertical off axis. Now, keep in mind the the red line is on tweeter axis, and as we go from orange to yellow to green, we're moving up four inches. So not a huge change, but as you can see, there is a huge hole in the response right there around the crossover point from the tweeter to the mid. It's right at about 2,600 hertz. It's a pretty big hole. And there's also, uh, at some point there, a big peak that you see up in the upper frequency. So a little bit rough going on. And then we decided, because it's such a big speaker, let's move down instead of being going from the tweeter up. Let's go from the tweeter down and see what happens. So this is the vertical alpha axis going down. You'll see red to orange to yellow to green with each four inch movement. Now think about it, it, we're moving down four inches at a time. So watch those lines from red to orange and what happened, and then from orange to yellow, what happened, and then from yellow to green. And you can see it got a little crazy there. It's frequency response is moving all over the place because as you get closer to the acoustic centers of one driver, you get further away from the other and it causes a time delay that causes huge cancellations. We call that comb filtering. And this speaker experiences a lot of comb filtering all in the up and down range. So, so long as you're kind of at tweeter level and you've got this adjusted this way, you're in pretty good shape. But anything above or below, and it's a little bit rough. Uh, horizontal off-axis is not bad. And we wound up taking horizontal off axis in both directions because this is an asymmetrical alignment, which is good. Uh, didn't save them in both directions, so sorry about that. The, on the initial stock measurement, I think we went this direction, which was the better way to go. And yeah, there's some lumpiness there, but overall, 
It's not bad. And here's what really impressed me about this speaker. If you look at the spectral decay, you don't see a lot of stored energy there. You don't see a lot of ringing or breakup. Um, there's a little bit of a peak in the woofer's response, right about 1400 hertz, that's real aggressive. And the crossover is a low order filter and it had it pretty down by that frequency, but it's still popping its little head up there and causing a little amplitude peak. But other than that, it looked great. And then the impedance curve, uh, it stays fairly low. It's a low impedance. It's a, it dips to four ohms right at a hundred Hertz and the tuning frequency was right at 28 point something Hertz. And there was a little resonance there. It looks like at about 30 Hertz where we've got um, some internal resonance of the box that's coming back out the port and it's showing up with a little blip right there. Um, so next we took this thing apart and took a look on the inside. And sadly, there's not much there. Uh, this whole box was empty. There wasn't any insulation in it or anything. Now, I don't know if that's the way they sent it out from the factory, but that's the way it showed up. There's nothing in there. Uh, in fact, I, we took some pictures of the inside of it. We'll have uh, we'll have our editor, Ron, throw those up there so you can see what the insides look like. And there's a picture of uh, this little contraption here with the attenuators on it uh, opened up. And the whole crossover is just mounted right there on it. So there's not much in the way of crossover on this thing. And the crossover parts, as you can imagine, were really poor. And this thing was certainly built to a price point. Now, granted... It measured pretty well if you're on tweeter axis, and the sensitivity is really high. It's about almost 98 dB average on the sensitivity. So you could crank this thing and rock the house with these things. And that's what a lot of people did with them. And that's why a lot of them were sold. That's what drew a lot of people to them is they play really loud, and they were really fun to listen to. As an audiophile, though, were the audiophile quality speaker? No. Um, they had some issues, especially when you look at the cabinet itself. The cabinet is a big hollow box. There's no bracing in this other than there was one little brace across the back. But I could just sit sit there running sideways to this thing, lighting this cabinet up, and it would light up like a like a Christmas tree, man. Just it's gonna resonate at multiple frequencies from 80 hertz to 150 hertz like crazy, uh, and it's gonna be very audible that it's a really noisy box so that's just the way those things were built back then they're built to a price point and um they're built just to crank up really loud and have fun with them um but let's see if we can take this old speaker and turn it into something that sounds really good and i think we can um first thing i had to do was let's look at the individual driver responses so I'm shooting the tweeter and the mids and the woofer individually. And let's look at the tweeter's response. It's, it almost averages 100 dB. It's a little uh, foam diaphragm tweeter, real lightweight. It's got a pretty good little motor structure on it. And it's a screamer. Uh, it's a little lumpy. Uh, there's a big old peak there right in the middle of its response that I knew I was going to have to work on a little bit. But overall, it's, it's got some output, and it went reasonably low in its range. The mid-range actually has a pretty smooth response all the way across. There's some little, um, there's a little bit of energy there in the stored uh, um, energy, a little stored energy there you can see in the spectral decay. Sorry about that. Uh, but overall, not too bad. At the top of its range, there's some breakup, but I think we can keep it well out of that range. Uh, now let's look at the woofer's response. And we'll look at that also with the spectral decay. And as you can see, the woofer's got a smooth range that's maybe usable from six or 700 hertz and down. And above that, it, it gets out of shape. There's a lot of stored energy and a lot of breakup. Uh, as you get above 1,000, there's a big peak right there at about 1,400 hertz and a lot of nasty stuff going on after that. So that pretty well told me that woofer's going to have to be kept down below, you know, five or 600 hertz at the, at the most. The mid-range has got a usable range I can work with. And if I can straighten out that tweeter's response, we might just have something. Uh, another way I look at this is I look at the raw drivers overlaid on top of each other. And that way I can kind of see the output levels and what I've got to work with. And 
in this case, it looked it looked promising. So the next thing then is to go in and 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 also when we when I reassembled this thing and ran all the wiring out the port that's on the back, um, I put quite a bit of insulation in there to help control some of the back wave off of this woofer. So um, then I started looking at individual driver measurements and what I can do to allow them to function within the range that they can function within and still create a nice smooth response. And it took a little bit of work. There was a little bit of a notch filter on the tweeter there to try and bring down that humped up area. But let's look at the new crossover response. So this is a frequency response and you can see on there the individual driver measurements and what range they fell in. And you notice with that notch filter I was able to use with the tweeter, got that hump out of it and then a simple second order was able, I was able to just roll it off nice and smoothly. Great roll off on that thing and I was with a little tweaking, I was able to get the mid to roll off on both sides uh, and match the roll off of the woofers. Uh, didn't have to use a lot of parts on this thing, but it, it involves some. It's a three-way, and there are big values on some of the lower crossover points. Um, so it's going to be pretty reasonable price-wise. Um, let's look at the new vertical off-axis, and it looks great. Now that I've pushed those crossover points a little further down, and they're a little more in phase over a wider range. You can see now going from the tweeter axis moving up, it looks great. And I should have done, I uh, should have saved it also going down. I looked at it some going down. It looked great that way too. Um, but yeah, it's good now over a really wide range. And then let's look at the horizontal off axis. I did that in both directions. Um, let's first look at it going away from the tweeter. And it it drops off pretty smoothly. There's still an area around 2K hertz that doesn't really drop off too much. A lot of that has to do with the surface area of this baffle and the reflections that are coming off of it. Some of it may have to do with the edge diffraction. All of these things are surface mount. They're not flush mount. So that causes a little bit of waviness, especially in the off axis. And then the off axis going towards the tweeter that's going toward the inside uh, drops off pretty well there too. It crowns a little bit, about a dB or two, right there at 2K hertz still. So it's a little bit of a hot spot there. So um, I made sure that the frequency response on axis wasn't bright there at all. I kind of softened it there a little. Um, let's look at the spectral decay now. It's especially clean. I'm really surprised how clean the spectral decay is on this big speaker. And then let's look at the impedance curve. And now we're only dropping to 4.3 ohms. So because of the bigger coal that I'm using, pulling that woofer, uh, response back a little bit that added a little bit of resistance and balanced out the impedance a little bit. So all in all, it's turned out really well. I mean, it's a really smooth response over a wide range. Now it's probably on tweeter axis. It's plus or minus less than a DB and a half from end to end. Uh, so we're putting together a little parts package for this thing. Uh, it's going to in include all new wiring because wiring was in, the, in there was just garbage and it's going to include a set of tube connectors which is going to be a big upgrade on this speaker because this had a little spring-loaded push-in connectors where you just pulled your little spring-loaded clamp down and you slid bare wire into it and let it go it was the cheapest thing you could do back in the day but it's the worst connection ever and bare wire tends to oxidize pretty quickly so you don't really want to be using bare wire on your speaker connections so set of tube connectors are going to resolve that and improve the signal transfer by a lot. So uh, a lot of good things going on and we're going to include sheets of no res. And when you, when you get this thing apart, if you've got this and you want to do this upgrade, take it apart. I would recommend cutting some three quarter inch by three quarter inch strips of MDF and diagonal cut them 45 degrees on each end and then glue those things in from the sides to the back and in even some case maybe here from the front to that other side over there and and glue in a lattice of bracing that will help stiffen this thing up and keep it from flexing so much because this woofer is going to put a lot of stress on this box it does and it's going to resonate a lot so gluing in those braces will stiffen the thing up and keep it from making so much noise and then Go in and line it with no res. The no res is 
again, a heavy damping layer and then a foam layer. Putting that in there will damp out the resonances of the panels and quieten it down quite a bit. So not a lot of buzzing going on with each bass note. You should hear clean, less distorted bass notes once that is focused on. You know, fix your box problems, clarity goes way up. So uh, we're gonna have to calculate how many sheets of no res this thing's gonna take. It, there's a lot of surface area on the inside of this box. Even if you go in and you drop in some bracings that are bracing that is in diagonals like that, it's it's gonna it's gonna need a lot of sheets of no res. So it's not gonna be a dirt cheap upgrade, but it's gonna be an upgrade that we're gonna work on or focus on being as affordable as possible. We're not gonna include the highest level, you know, sauna caps and everything and stuff like that. We're gonna try to keep this affordable to where it's not a big investment to take this speaker and bring it to a modern level and bring it up to a level where suddenly you can really enjoy it. You can have fun with it. It still averages 97 dB sensitivity all the way across, so it'll get after it, but you should have resolution and detail levels that are far beyond it ever had from the factory. So we're taking this one up a lot of notches and all you guys that have some of these sitting in your basement or in your garage, it might be time to revitalize some of these things, you know, get those, get those vintage speakers out and redo them and enjoy them and have some fun with it, especially if the drivers are in good shape. And this one looked like almost new condition. Uh, a lot of times the, the foam surrounds on these things just completely deteriorate and fall apart. This is in great shape. And if you've got one like it in great shape, this model, this kit is going to be for you. Um, that's it for this one. Um, I guess uh, I don't really have anything else to add. Um, thank you for watching the videos. I appreciate it a lot. And please hit the subscribe button if you haven't. See you guys in the next video.